Um, I'd like to welcome to the platform John Pritchard, who's Head of Apprenticeships at BCS. John, he's behind me. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I think when I looked at the room this morning and, and, and yesterday, I don't think it's anything to do with people not being here about a late night last night, but it's more, are they disappointed that the rota wasn't announced yesterday? Are they still in the apprenticeship game? What's going on? And I think where we're asking now what's going to happen in 2020, there's some questions what's going to happen this week, next week, let alone when we go down the road um, further afield. But BCS is new to the apprenticeship field. They've been involved with apprenticeships now for, for four years. Um, they came to the fruition when the, the standards were first initiated. Uh, there were three awarding organisations or assessment organisations that came forward at the point to, to represent the digital industries. That was OCR, City and Guilds, and then BCS who were new. And just in that short time frame of where we started uh, four years ago, OCR have already pulled out. And, and the complexities of, of people coming to the marketplace to support this new incentive um, and, and this industry where we need to keep people into the, in our sectors or learners on this journey they start is, is an expensive um, ride. Uh, and OCR have taken that decision to, to move away from this for, for that very reason and concentrate on technicals. BCS are incurring vast amounts of money. City and Guilds are. And I know other sectors are in exactly the same position. And when you look at how that impacts on you as the providers, the employers and the learners, that's going to continue over the next two or three years because of the uncertainty that's attached to it. And, and right now, we all know that there's a new list that's going to be released April next year that is removing more frameworks. And as those frameworks are taken off of the list, is that driving people towards the standards? The cynical approach says yes, and some of those standards are funded at a lower funding band. Is that the reason that they're putting them in there? It's now employers' money, and the employers want the best value. We've heard this morning about quality and not quantity. If we are reducing the cost for some of you as providers to deliver these higher technical skills in digital itself, and you reduce the funding, can the providers get the skilled people to deliver? Interestingly, cyber keeps coming up. Skilled people for cyber to deliver it. Where are we finding all these skilled people to deliver those things? There's some big, big questions still to be answered in the next couple of years. And to fully embed and establish this where we all want to be and we all want to provide a good service. So many, many providers now are looking at where do they find these skills? What standards should they invest in? What's the best route to take? Which frameworks should they still carry on and use before they transfer to a standard? I don't know um, how many people will get through the rota first time round. I don't think any of us will. So the commitments that people are having just for this year with the levy starting in May, can they fulfil those commitments if they're not on the register? If they can't access those employers funding? How many more rounds do they have to go before they get onto the next stage? So just in this next three, four months, there are very, very uh, many questions still to be answered. When we get to 2020, how does that change? Right now, there are standards that were, were uh, written four years ago, the very first standards, eight employer groups, that are up for, to be revised at this stage already and, and we're just having the first endpoint assessments of these people come into fruition yet the standard is there to be re revised looked at and in our sector in digital digital changes daily let alone after three years how much do we update that now no one is looking to review that standard currently uh, the network engineering software developer because we're still waiting for government decisions and decisions from dfe and if you invest in that now we could have to change that in three weeks time four weeks time when the next announcement comes out so there's this stability that's still needed and as um you you start using the new infrastructures and the systems we've got uh, a crossover period People that are currently delivering against the frameworks are claiming certification through FIS and through the ACE system. There's a new SFA system coming into play for standards, and we claim them through the SFA. FIS will 
carry on, or the A system will carry on supporting those standards. And in 2020, when all standards finish, uh, or all frameworks finish, sorry, and standards are the only ones, there will be an overlap period and a runoff for those people that have started and still engaged in that framework. How long do we have these multiple systems running that, that people, and if we've got employer providers out there who are brand new to this environment, confused over what they've still got to um, address and where they claim something, how it's claimed, what's the implications for them. So on top of that now, and I think very, very importantly, is by the time we get to 2020, there will be more in pathways from level two to level seven. And so we will have this um, opportunity that people start on their journey as it should be for lifelong learning and, and get to a master's. I think ultimately every standard is linked to a professional body and therefore there will be more people who have professional status and we've got the, the technicians register at, at BCS. We will start seeing in, in two years time people who have started on level three go on to Sophia level three but come off of their apprenticeship and still continue on a professional career and be at Sophia four and five. Great progression never existed before in our sector, but because every standard is like that on other sectors, we heard from CMI and others, more and more, more people will have this professional status that they never had before. A case and example for me is the MOD are now aligned in standards and the way that things are being delivered. Someone leaving the military or someone leaving the civil service can take those skills and those transferable skills and go to another job when they're recognised. Not have to retrain because they're not recognised with what they created in the MOD and it, BT don't recognise that qualification. We've aligned these to professional certificates that, that exist in there. Can we get a more transferable workforce? Can we get to a stage where someone's done a level three and a level four and we get to the point where they now want to go and do a degree? Do they have to start that degree again and do a full three-year degree? Can't we use some of those transferable skills because they're not mapped in already? And, and I know David's nodding at me from the Open University. That, that's where we should be aiming for in 2020. We do, employers don't want to spend and start someone on another three-year journey. We want this continuous learning and we want people to have those transferable skills, not just in digital. Digital fits across all of the sectors now. But if someone's done a job in digital, they should be able to move and not have to retrain the full thing. Where does those transferable skills fit in to each organisation? And I think that's the piece of work that, that will be done um, and continue to be done up to 2020. Because employers now, and I, rightly or wrongly, the government don't think the levy is going to be spent. Personally, Every employer I'm talking to sees the 90-10 split of, of co-funding and incentive of, of even doing more training. If they use that pot that they don't think that the bigger companies are going to spend, um, they could be in deficit on that. Where's the money coming for it? But I do think that there will be this, this investment from the, the, the smaller organisations. But the one thing that has been said many times about collaboration this 10% that the large employers have got, how do they use their supply chains? How do they work with those other industries and their, their other organisations to transfer that money so it's not lost and give those transferable skills, but maybe in the way they want to progress those people in a career that could come on to that larger organisation eventually? Because if they're investing down there, where's their benefit unless it, it is in a proper supply chain that's selling their goods? So there's, there's going to be a whole shift um, my personal belief in, in that way and how these industries and, and different sectors work collaborative. Not just universities, training providers, but the employers. Because it's employers' money and the employers want the best thing. And everybody's talked about numbers and quality. If the employers don't get the quality for what they're paying for, this isn't going to work. So I think there'll be more emphasis now, and there already is, I'm seeing from the first employer groups that sat around that table writing the software developer and network engineer standards, going back now saying, this isn't what we asked for. This has moved away from where we wanted. We want our money spent in the right way. How do we go back and get what we originally designed? And so by the time we get there, I think not only um, DFE, or the IFA having fully implemented their, their um, 
board and, and the quality and the processes they want to put in place. But I think there, the opportunity of having these panels and people that are applying for those panels are on the, some of the original work groups. And they'll be able to feed back directly in there and get that message in because at the moment they don't have a direction to do that. And so by 2020, I think those messages will be heard louder than they are now. And that will be able to be taken into consideration. But I think, for me, there's, there's different things. We were at the wards last night. There's apprenticeship awards all this week. And every stage has 16 to 23 year olds. We'll start seeing 50 and 60 year olds receiving awards because that workforce is going to be some of the workforce that, that people are investing in. And so there'll be a different culture of the types of people doing it. Are they all going to be called apprentices? No, because you're not going to attract people on apprenticeships with the stigma. How do people rebadge that internally? We will see a whole multitude of things go and, and be used to convince these people to do it. But I won't be shocked if in two years' time I go to an apprenticeship ward and there's someone at 50 years old receiving the first apprenticeship award of, his, of their age for contributions or what they've done. And it, it will change dramatically how these people work. So I, I just want to um, probably leave you with, with a question. Is how does it drive recruitment and how do HR think now when they start looking at who does an apprenticeship? Do they bring in a new person? Do they reinvest in the person that's in the workplace? How do they advertise that? Because right now, every HR company or HR person I talk to doesn't know how much money it's going to cost to take someone on. If they do increase the headcount, that's more levy they've got to pay. Where does that person fit into the business? Do they move some from one area, one department, into another department and give them a new job description and put them through an apprenticeship and map in current training? The HR thought process for these employers now to get the best out of their investment is changing dramatically. And I don't think they have an answer or know who to ask the best approach that they can get that for the betterment of all those people and the investment of the money that they've put in there. I'll leave you that thought. Thank you.